This is Mrs. Ignacio for PNR 104, Basic Skills. This is Chapter 16. Chapter 16 in your Fundamentals textbook, your Basic Skills textbook. We're going to be talking about prevention of infection, how do we control infection, and what our role is as the nurse. All right. So here's the list of the objectives. And remember, when we think about the objectives, these are the things that we should know at the end of our discussion or at the end of you reading or at the end of the time uh, you spent studying. So we're going to talk about the microorganisms that can cause uh, infections to humans. We're going to talk about the links that chain of infection that you something you definitely need to know because we want to break those links so we don't pass on infection to our patients. We're also going to discuss the factors that make older adults more susceptible to infection. Some of you automatically are thinking things are slowing down, their immune system is more vulnerable, and that is true. We're going to explain how the body's protective mechanisms work to prevent infection, and we're also going to explain how the inflammatory and immune responses protect the body. Okay, so let's talk about infection. What is infection? So when we think about infection, hopefully you're thinking, you know what, the skin is our first line of defense against injury and infection. You may be thinking that infection is caused by pathogens and pathogens are disease causing organisms, things that try to make us sick. Now, some of these disease-causing organisms, these pathogens and the or microorganisms, they produce toxins that make us sick. Some of them may release endotoxins that make us sick as well. And in our patients and in humans in general, infection can result in illness and different kinds of diseases. So what are the infectious agents, those pathogens? Well, they can be bacteria, prions, viruses, protozoas, <laughs> excuse me, protozoas, um, ricketaceas, fungi, and helmets. There's also mycoplasmas and chlamydia. So these are examples of infectious agents. And note that there's different ways to fight each of these infectious agents. Antibiotics are reserved for your bacterias. Okay, so when we think about mycoplasms, these are small organisms, they don't have a cell wall, they can infect your mucous membranes like your respiratory tract or your genital tract. And an example of that is mycoplasma pneumoniae, <clears throat> excuse me, and then chlamydia affects the genitourinary and reproductive tracts. And unfortunately, it's becoming more common these days. Okay, so when we think about the chain of infection, this is an important uh, kind of thing for you to think about. So here's the links, and I'm going to actually talk about the links, but I'm going to show you the visual because I think that for those of you who are visual learners, it might be easier to really understand. So on the screen, you should see the causative agent. What is causing the illness? It's going to be one of those pathogens that we mentioned. It could be a bacteria, it could be a virus. So that's the causative agent. Then we have the reservoir. Where does this agent hang out? Okay. Um, and so when we think about the causative agent, again, it could be bacteria, it could be protozoa, it could be uh, the ricketaceas, the fungi, the helmets, but this is a microorganism that causes the condition, <clears throat> excuse me, in your patient. Um, and so when we think of the word virulence of the agent, that is, okay, how is this agent going to actually affect your your patient okay when we think about the the virulent so how bad is it going to be okay how uh, strong is this microorganism's ability to cause harm to your patient okay so that's what we have to kind of think about there okay so when we think about that um, we'll go now to the reservoir. The reservoir is where the microorganisms can be found. So the reservoir can be an infected wound. It could be human waste, animal waste. Um, it can be 
waste of animals or insects. It could be in on the insects, rodents, contaminated food, water, <coughs> excuse me, as well as a person with the infection. So how can we prevent infection at this reservoir? Well, good hand hygiene, sterile technique, those are all things that we can do to prevent, to prevent uh, the infection to be spread. Okay, so the third part, which is the green rectangle, is going to be the portal of exit. Okay, so that's the third part, link three of this chain of infection. So when we think about the portal of exit, how does this pathogen, this disease-causing organism, leave the host? So it can leave through the GI tract, gastrointestinal tract, through feces. Okay, so we, we know that feces are contaminated with bacteria. Um, it can also leave the respiratory tract. These microorganisms or these pathogens are released in coughing and seize and sneezing. And examples are measles, mumps, tuberculosis. They can be transmitted from the exit uh, or transmitted by exit from the respiratory tract. Again, that coughing, that sneezing, those droplets linger in the air. They can contaminate surfaces, cough over someone's drink. Now the drink is contaminated. For the skin, open mucous membranes, open areas of skin, open wounds, that could be a portal of exit. How these pathogens will exit that reservoir, okay? Now let's talk about the mode of transfer. And that's link four. That is the yellow rectangle that you see in the infection chain. So now we think about how is this pathogen, link four, going to the next person? Okay, so it could be through direct contact with body excretions from drainage, uh, from a wound, <coughs> excuse me, an infected wound a boil, right? And so also, it can also be transferred through indirect contact. So inanimate objects, which are sometimes called fomites. So needles, eating utensils, right? Dressings of, from wounds, right? So that's why it's important to keep your area clean and sanitary so we're not transferring any potential pathogens to ourselves or to other patients. Also, modes of transfer can be through vectors like uh, mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are known to uh, transfer malaria, dengue fever, uh, Zika virus, right? And then we think about another mode of transfer is droplet infection. So aerosol, if someone coughs or sneezes, uh, they don't have on a mask, all of those droplets are going out into the area. Uh, and also we can spread infection from one part of the body to another. So that's going to be important. And again, hand hygiene is going to be your number one way to fight against these kinds of modes of transfer. Okay, so remember, um, we're up to link four now, but to break this chain of infection, we have to figure out, okay, how are we going to stop the transmission? How are we going to stop it from entering or exiting? And hand washing, good hygiene is going to be key. Let's look at the portal of entry. How does it get in, right? And this is our peach kind of uh, rectangle in our infection chain in this picture. How does it get in? This is the fifth part of the chain of infection. So how does it get in to my susceptible host? Well, through the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the trachea, the skin, these mucous membranes. So we tell our patients, of course, wash your hands, don't rub your eyes, don't put things in your mouth or your nose. Um, those are all important things. And so as nurses, we have to remember to prevent these entry of microorganisms. We only use sterile items, clean items when we're caring for our patient. If something has fallen on the floor, we can't use it on our patient. We're using barrier precautions. We're using gloves and masks, right? We tell our patients to use condoms. Those are all important things to prevent this entry of the pathogen to this potential susceptible host. We also want to safely handle food, water, use good personal hygiene, avoid high-risk behaviors. That could be sexual promiscuity, uh, even sharing needles, um, you know, so those are, you know, high-risk behaviors. So we we teach our patients the risks and how to mitigate those risks. Also use protection from incest bites and stings. And also if there is an incest bite, 
insect bite or sting, pay close attention to it and carefully monitor, especially now summertime is coming. If you see a bullseye or rash, that tells you, whoa, that could be Lyme disease, right? From the bite of a tick. All right, now the sixth link in this chain of infection, which is our pink rectangle, this is your susceptible host. So this is someone that may be susceptible because of their age, the very young and the very old are highly susceptible. Also their state of health. What if they have other conditions, other comorbidities? What if they're immunocompromised? What if they have broken skin? These are all things that make someone increase risk as a susceptible host to, uh, to receive these pathogens in their body. Now, susceptibility can be decreased, <coughs> excuse me, by teaching good health practices, eating plenty of fruits and vegetables, hydration, water, uh, that's going to be important. Hygiene is going to be important. Again, hand washing, can't emphasize that enough. And immunizations, immunizations, especially for the very young, those are your pediatric patients from newborn, your school-aged children, right, toddlers, and then also immunizations for your geriatric patients or senior citizens. 50, 55, 65, we're always offering uh, flu vaccines, COVID vaccines, pneumonia, meningitis vaccines. Those are all super important things when we think about uh, our chain of infection and particularly our susceptible host. All right, let's talk about some things that will make our patient, our older adult patient at risk. All right, so when we think about our older adult patient that is at risk, we know a lot of times they may have uh, or they may suffer from poor nutrition and they may be immobile, they're bed bound, or they may have a sedentary lifestyle due to injury. They also may have poor hygiene because they're not able to get up and care for themselves. They may have chronic illness like diabetes, hypertension, and they also, as an older adult, will have that thinning skin. Right. We know that that thinning skin uh, can make them at increased risk because your skin is your first line of defense against injury and infection. OK, so these are things, factors to keep in mind of the susceptibility of your older adult patient. So how does the human body defend itself against infection? Well, again, intact skin is the first line of defense against injury and infection. We have mucous membranes that secrete lysosomes. So even in our tears, in our saliva, these secretions help and they are antibacterial. We have cilia in our respiratory tract that sweep the mucus that catches all of these pathogens or most of them, right? And sweeps it away from the lungs. We have these uh, cuffer cells that are in the liver and we also have gastric secretions. Our stomach is just a bag of acid. The pH of the stomach is from one to four. And that acidity is actually important for killing any bad bacteria that may come in with our food, okay? <laughs> The second line of defense is the body's mechanisms to protect itself in terms of fever. So if a patient has a fever, that is a sign that their body is trying to fight off this potential uh, pathogen, this infectious agent. So fever serves to slow the growth of the pathogens until other defenses can be mobilized. Those white blood cells will come on the scene. Now, leukocytosis occurs when these leukocytes, they engulf the invader. So the skin is broken, bacteria is coming in, right? And so uh, leukocytes will come and they will gobble up those pathogens. They will gobble up that bacteria. Phagocytosis also is a part of the second line of defense where cellular debris, uh, once that, that uh, pathogen is gobbled up, there's going to be some waste products. So the phagocytes, they will remove that cellular debris. They will de destroy bacteria, viruses, and again, remove those waste products. Inflammation is also an important part of the immune response because with inflammation, mast cells are activated, histamines are released, and also white blood cells know, hey, you need to go over there because there is an area of infection. Okay, interferons are also important because they stimulate antiviral proteins. And so the body has all of these mechanisms to deal with whichever 
uh, you know, invader is present. So that inflammatory response is going to be important because it's uh, localized. It's uh, to protect the tissues in the particular area of infection. With the inflammatory response, we have a dilating of blood vessels. More blood is going to come. And so, yes, that area is going to be red. There's going to be warm. There's going to be some edema or swelling. That's a normal thing for us to see. And that lets us know, right, if you see it on a test question, if you see it in your patient, they have an area that is red, that is swollen, that is a sign, potential sign of infection. So the purpose of this inflammatory response in our body is to neutralize and destroy those harmful agents, to limit their spread to other tissues of the body, and prepare the damaged tissues for repair. That's going to be really, really important. Okay, really, really important. <clears throat> All right. So let's go now to our immune response. When we think about immune response, well, there's different kinds of immune response. So we have passive acquired immunity. And so with passive acquired immunity, we can give an antitoxin, an antiserum, and these antitoxins and antiserums contain antibodies or antitoxins. And so that's going to help our patient to fight off whatever these toxins are. There's also naturally acquired passive immunity. The fetus receives antibodies from the mother and that is through breast milk. So that's why breast milk is so, so important, especially for um, a newborn or an infant that is immunocompromised or that has health issues. Breast milk can really be a lifesaver. <laughs> Okay, artificially acquired immunity. Okay, that's artificially man-made. That's through immunizations. So we know that we receive immunizations as soon as we're born, all the way up to our geriatric years. There's different immunizations. Many of you are familiar with the immunizations because you're trying to get your clinical clearance, right? But that is artificially acquired immunity. Now there is passive artificially acquired immunity, and that's when we're injecting antibodies of derived serum of infected people or animals. We saw a lot of this when COVID first came out. They were receiving, COVID patients were receiving the plasma of patients that had survived COVID, right? And that was a way to build up that patient's immune response, and that is passive artificially acquired immunity. Okay, so now we're going to move into the second part of our chapter, chapter 16. We're looking at, okay, the means for removal and destruction of these microorganisms, uh, if they're animate, if they're alive or inanimate. We're also going to talk about medical asepsis and surgical asepsis, and we're going to talk about disinfecting and sterilization. Okay, those are all important things to talk about. In the clinical setting, what we need to think about is, okay, how we can control infection in our patients, right? Because we don't want to pass on infection in our patients in a hospitalized setting or a clinical setting. Proper hand hygiene is going to be something that you're going to be doing, uh, especially with Mrs. Holland, when you do your skills. Understand the importance of the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, because because they set a lot of the guidelines that we have to follow. Also understanding how to educate your patient, how to teach your patient how to properly hand wash, how to properly change their wound if they do have a wound. What are some of the signs and symptoms that that wound is getting infected, right? So these are all important things. And I know when you're with Mrs. Holland, you're going to be discussing much of this and you're going to actually be performing those skills. So let's talk about asepsis and the control of these microorganisms. Again, these microorganisms are the pathogens that seek to cause disease in your patient. So asepsis, making the environment and objects free of microorganisms. And we're going to talk about the different ways that we can uh, keep this environment clean and purple wipes, bleach wipes, sterilization of equipment, right? Those are all great things we can do. Hand washing, that's going to be great. Now, 
medical asepsis, we're going to reduce the number of organisms or reducing the risk of transmission of organisms. Okay, and so this is really important when we think about patients that are going for surgery, uh, patients that are having invasive procedures. And when I say invasive, anything that goes inside of our patient's body. Okay, that is an invasive procedure. If you have to cut the patient open, if you have to insert something in one of the orifices, that is an invasive procedure. So these medical asepsis is designed to prevent the spread of infection to person to person or reinfecting the person, right? The same person. An example could be Foley catheter insertion. When I am inserting a Foley catheter in my patient, my female patient, um, I'm looking for the urinary meatus. I may accidentally stick the Foley catheter tubing into the vagina. If I do that, I'm going to leave it in the vagina and then get a new kit, and then I'm going to go above that because I know that that opening was not the correct one. I will not remove that Foley catheter from the vagina and then insert it into the urinary meatus because then I will be re I will be infecting my patient okay because we know in the vagina there's a normal bacterial flora there's normal things that live there and that's okay as long as it stays in the vagina but if I introduce that to the urinary system which is a sterile system I can cause infection in my patient so that's what it means if we are infecting the same person all right, so when we think about medical asepsis, we're cleaning, we're protecting items from contamination, we're disinfecting, we're sterilizing, <laughs> okay? All important concepts, okay? Now, surgical asepsis, this is even more serious, okay? So we are preparing instruments so we don't want anything to be contaminated in any way. So this is where you'll have really specific procedures for sterilization of all surgical instruments used in surgery. So they will be cleaned and then they will be sanitized, disinfected, sterilized using heat most of the time, using heat or special solutions to make sure that when we are performing these invasive procedures that the patient does not become infected, okay? So that's going to be really important, surgical asepsis. We don't want to introduce infection into our patients when we're using, for example, catheters and needles and or needles, okay? Hand hygiene. All right, you all know this. Hand hygiene is the most effective way to reduce microorganisms. We have our hands and they're pretty dirty. We're touching doorknobs. We're touching our faces. We're touching books. We're touching our cell phones. We're touching keyboards. So please, 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 hand hygiene. I can't emphasize that enough. Gloves should be used to prevent contact with any bodily fluids, any uh, skin that's not intact, any mucous membrane, any secretions from your patients. Hand hygiene before you touch your patient, after you care for your patient. Always, always, always <laughs> observe hand hygiene. Okay. All right, so standard precautions. We are going to treat all patients as if they have something we don't want to take home to our families. So standard precaution consists of hand hygiene, gloves, uh, proper fitting gloves. That's why your nails can't be long because if you have long nails, guess what? You can puncture your gloves. And I don't know about you, but if I'm cleaning a patient that has C. diff, I don't want a hole in my glove. If I'm caring for a wound that has MRSA, I don't want a hole in my glove, okay? No, thank you. So that's why, you know, having your nails low at the level of your fingertips, right, not to extend past is really important. It's to keep you safe, to keep your patient safe. Masks, eye protection, and face shield are definitely uh, recommended and a lot of times required if you think that there's going to be a splash or a spray. Uh, here's a funny story. One time I was uh, caring for a patient doing a peg uh, feeding and this patient had a tube going directly into their GI, their gastrointestinal, <laughs> excuse me, system. And 
their peg tube was clogged and I'm like, okay, I'm going to flush this. I'm going to flush this. I'm going to flush this. And I was working, trying to flush it. And then it splashed in my face. And oh my goodness, I was just grateful out of all of my patients that I was assigned. That was the only patient that wasn't on contact isolation. And I was grateful that I wore glasses, right? But again, if you think there's a risk of anything splashing in your face, masks, eye protection, face shield, it's okay. Wear it. Keep yourself safe. Gown, of course, because you may be leaning against a patient coming in close contact with them. Uh, patient care equipment. So that's going to be your blood pressure machines, blood pressure cuffs. Usually if a patient is on isolation, they keep a machine in the room. They Every patient should have their own blood pressure cuff. If we're using things on our patient, if they're disposable, we dispose of them. If they're reusable, then we sanitize them before using it on the next patient, right? Like those pulse ox, uh, pulse oximeters, when the, those finger probes, we should be cleaning them uh, before and after use. Also, when we think about uh, standard precautions, environmental control, the patient may be on a particular isolation, droplet, contact, um, airborne precautions, depending on what their condition is that is potentially contagious, right, and infectious to others. Linens, please don't put your linens on the floor. Put them immediately into the dirty linen receptacle. If you have a linen bag that is halfway full, empty it because guess what? It's going to become really heavy and you can hurt your back. And yes, as a nurse, I have emptied linen. I have emptied the trash. If I change a patient and they had a malodiferous wound or if they had, you know, fecal incontinence, sometimes even bladder incontinence, it smells really bad. I'm not going to leave that in the room because it's going to affect the patient. It's just not a, a sanitary practice. Okay. So that's going to be important to understand. All right. So bloodborne pathogens, that's some of the training that you had to do, right, for your clinical clearance to make sure that we are abiding by the OSHA guidelines and we are treating our bodily fluids and disposing things that are contaminated bodily fluids as they should be. Excuse me. And when we think about patient placement, that's going to be not only isolation, but if we are pairing up patients or patients have roommates, we usually put like conditions with like conditions. So if both patients have pneumonia, okay, they could probably go in the same room. However, if you see it on a test question, if a patient has shingles, they should not be with another patient that has shingles because there's different phases of shingles. Your shingles patient all the time needs to be in a room by themselves. Your tuberculosis patient patient all the time needs to be in a room by themselves and tuberculosis needs to be that tuberculosis patient needs to be in a negative pressurized room okay negative pressurized room so the air in that room is not mixing with the rest of the facility so the gown itself and when you're with Mrs. Holland, you're going to be practicing donning and doffing. I know that I, in the classroom, I think I posted some videos on how to properly don, put on, and doff, remove your PPE, your protective equipment. So the gown, that is a clean barrier. It's impermeable to fluid. Um, it must be impermeable to water. And so we remove it after use, and we're going to just rip it off and roll it away from our body. We don't want to contaminate our skin or our clothing when we are using the gowns, okay? When we apply a mask, I think uh, we are very familiar with masks, aren't we? Right? So we apply it before entering the room uh, that when we have a patient that has an airborne pathogen or if we think we're going to have being splashed with bodily fluids, we'll put the mask on. Uh, that wire goes over the nose. We pinch it down to form a good seal. Okay? The N95, we have to be fitted to make sure that we're wearing the right size. And again, the pulmonary tuberculosis was the original N95, but now since COVID has been out, we're using the N95 for COVID as well. Any 
airborne microorganisms is going to be the N95. Protective eyewear, that's going to be important. So that's going to protect anything from coming in contact with your very sensitive and precious eyes. It could be goggles, a face shield, or glasses that have a side top and pieces, right? The little pieces, maybe you had them in high school when you were doing your lab. But we want to make sure that we are protecting the eyes. Now, the head cover is going to be really important. So as a nurse, um, I really think it's safer and sanitary not to have like a lot of big hair. I know some hairstyles require a lot of hair, um, at even adding extra hair. But the problem is that if your hair becomes contaminated, now you have to go through the process of removing it or, you know, so and really, a head cover is going to be really important, keeping your hair safe. Um, if um, you think that you're going to be, <laughs> excuse me, in danger of becoming contaminated with microorganisms, a head cover is always a good idea. Labor and delivery nurses, they're always wearing head covers because labor and delivery, it's a messy business. So they're always wearing their head covers Sur surgical nurses, nurses work in the OR, they're wearing their, their head covers. And it's it's just a good practice, especially if you have a lot of hair. It's a good practice as well. Okay. All right. So what is next? Shoe covers. Shoe covers are important so we don't carry the pathogens outside of the room. Okay, covers should be removed when we exit the room. Again, your OR nurses and OR staff, your labor and delivery nurses, they're using those shoe covers. Gloves, we're using for everything, right? Standard precautions. If there's a chance that we're going to come in contact with blood, mucus, mucus membranes, secretions, skin that's not intact, we want to wear gloves. If you're unsure, wear gloves. OK, so we're going to reduce the possibility of transmission of microorganisms from the nurse to the patient and vice versa. Right. We don't want to infect anyone. We don't want to become infected. Now, let's talk about latex allergies. It's a good practice to always assess for allergies in your patient, no matter what. OK, so latex allergy is something that's very specific and it could be really serious in some patients. Right. It could be leading to anaphylaxis where they have inflammation and swelling to the point where their airway can be swollen shut. OK, now latex allergy can cause redness. It can cause inflammation in the area that the latex was used. So, for example, if my patient has a latex allergy, I have latex gloves and I touch their hand. You may see that their hand is turning red It may become inflamed or they could become itchy. That's your, what your puritis is. OK. So with latex, we try really not to use latex at all in medical setting. If you do have a latex allergy, let your instructor know, let your clinical instructor know, make sure that you're paying attention to the signs um, if something has latex, all right? Um, so we want to be careful. Sometimes some of the equipment will have latex, like the Foley catheters. So that's something to be aware of. Um, sometimes your patients may have latex allergy. I would uh, double check if they have allergies to like kiwis and bananas. Sometimes that goes together, those kinds of allergies. Okay. So we don't use latex for routine tasks and we um, definitely want to dispose of it properly. And we don't use petroleum-based lotions under latex gloves, okay? Petroleum-based is just really not good in the healthcare setting. I know in some cultures, there's a lot of petroleum-based products that are used, but they actually can affect the effectiveness of your gloves. And petroleum-based items are also flammable. So it's just not a good idea in the healthcare setting. Okay, so disposing of sharps, never, ever, ever, ever recap a dirty needle. Once you use a needle on your patient, if you're delivering an immunization, you're drawing blood, whatever it is, immediately dispose of it in the sharps. Most needles nowadays will have a safety where you can just flip it up, um, the safety device with your thumb or index finger so that that 
dirty needle will not be exposed. But that's important. You don't want to stick yourself with a dirty needle. Never stick your hand into a sharps container. If something falls in there, it's gone. Let it go. Okay, never, ever, ever recap a dirty needle. If you have to recap a clean needle, for example, if you are mixing insulin, use the scoop method where you will put one hand behind your back is usually your non-dominant hand. And then your dominant hand will be used to scoop the cover onto that needle okay but you don't want to ever stick yourself with a dirty needle if you do uh, immediately wash that area with soap and water and then report it to the chain of command what will probably happen <laughs> if you're a student if you're a nurse excuse me you will uh, go get a blood draw to establish your baseline and your patient will get a blood draw to establish their baseline. And when I say baseline, are you infected with hepatitis, HIV, right? What's going on in your blood? Then you'll have another blood draw at three months after the incident, six months, nine months, and then 12 months. And sometimes they will offer you prophylactically, uh, especially if the patient is like HIV positive or hepatitis C positive, they will give you a prophylactic antibiotics, antiviral medications to prevent any infection if there's a high risk of you developing an infection from a, a needle stick, okay? Um, a needle stick is not the end of the world, but it's not something that you want to experience. So just be very careful. Okay. All right. Uh, contaminated waste. Waste must be properly disposed of. They have to be put in the biohazard bags, hazardous waste. And so what is considered a biohazard? If it's soiled, if it has blood, sanitary pads, dressing from a wound, suction drainage containers, anything that is contaminated with body fluid is contam considered contaminated waste. So when we clean, we clean in different ways. So pathogens can be killed or inactivated by disinfecting, by sterilization, or sanitizing agents. <clears throat> Here's a note to yourself. If you're using those, those purple top wipes, if you're using bleach wipes, wear gloves. If those wipes are strong enough to sanitize, to kill 99.9% .9 of the pathogens, they can also cause cancer in humans. So please make sure that you're not using your bare hands when you're handling those items, okay? So you also want to clean and remove debris in cold water scrub and wash in hot water and use a stiff bristle brush. A lot of times you'll see in uh, settings where we have to scrub in, they will have those brushes. We do have them in the skills lab. And when you are practicing hand washing, use those brushes so you know what it's like. You want to rinse when you're cleaning with hot water and then dry. Not, not your skin, but I'm talking about equipment, okay, equipment, because you want to use warm water on your skin because what happens if you use hot water on your skin, you um, will run the risk of breaking your skin down. And then if you have your skin broken down, now you're at risk for infection. When we think about disinfecting, we're using alcohol, we're using chlorine, um, we're using bleach, right? Um, we're using bactericidal or bacteriostatic, <coughs> excuse me, agents, right? And so this eliminates some organisms after cleaning, okay? Now, to go even further, after cleaning, disinfecting, and then there's sterilization. So there's five ways that we can sterilize, right? Uh, these materials or our equipment. And this is going to be the best method for eliminating microorganisms. So we can steam with moist heat, hot, dry air, ethylene oxide, low temperature gas plasma, or radiation. Um, I know for uh, COVID, they were using ultraviolet lights. A lot of times in patients' room, they would have those ultraviolet lights uh, to make sure that the room was sanitized and sterilized, right? So let's now talk about sepsis in the home environment. When we think about sepsis, sepsis is going to be an infection in the patient's bloodstream.
Okay, so a patient can become septic having bacterial infection in their bloodstream if they have a wound that is untreated, that's un infected. If they have a lung infection like pneumonia, uh, they can become septic. If they have, we talked about respiratory, if they have skin, if they have a GI infection. So any infection, urinary tract infection, untreated, any infection throughout the body in any of the body systems can lead to sepsis. Okay, so if the patient is at home and they have a risk of sepsis or if they're immunocompromised, we're using a 1 to 10 solution of chlorine, bleach, and water. And so this is for the counters, the bathrooms. We're using the dishwasher on the sanitized cycle. A lot of times you'll see questions about your HIV patients. They need to sanitize their toothbrushes in the dishwasher, okay, or use hydrogen peroxide solution, right, because they, the HIV patient or the chemotherapy patient, their immune system is not strong enough to fight off any infection, okay? So if there's a risk of sepsis, if the patient already has sepsis, <coughs> excuse me, if the patient is immunocompromised, we want to use bleach, we want to use the dishwasher and sanitize, we want to uh, keep the area as clean as possible, okay? For sepsis scissors, um, other instruments can be washed in hot water and detergent and then soaked in a bleach solution. Okay, exposing bedding and other items a patient use that can't be disinfected, we will put it out in the sun and that may reduce the number of microorganisms on them. When I was on deployment one time, there was a scabies breakout in the engineering birthing. So the sailors that were engineers in their birthing, the male birthing, they had a scabies breakout. And that was just a disaster because everyone, you know, on the ship were in close proximity and scabies is highly contagious, uh, these burrowing mites under your skin. And so they had to take all of their mattresses out of the birthing and take them to the top side of the ship so they could be uh, put out in the sun. Okay, so they are still actually doing that. Okay, infection control surveillance. Okay, so we do have infectious control nurses if that's something that interests you. Uh, but these um, infectious control practitioners, they are the ones responsible to make sure that we're following all the procedures for infection control. They assess the spread of infection and they work with the healthcare staff to make sure that everyone stays safe, to make sure that we're cleaning properly, to make sure that our environmental services are cleaning properly. They're not going to be using a cloth that they use to clean the toilet to wipe somebody's sink, right? So those are all things that are important in the spread uh, to eliminate the spread of infection. Okay, so at this time, that concludes the discussion of chapter 16. So please take some time to look at the summary notes as well at the end of the chapter. And I hope you do well. Always think like a nurse.